um, a, a notification. Except. <laughs> All right. And now I'm going to share my screen so we can walk through um, a presentation. Let's see. Just want to make sure that I'm not going to miss anyone. Um, walk through a, a presentation with some information about um, kind of elaborating on what Rick has said for um, why we're doing this. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so um, as, as Rick mentioned, um, EV charging is um, a priority on a number of levels, um, local, state, and national. So um, Scarborough's 2021 comprehensive plan um, identifies the need to increase energy conservation and efficiency. Um, EVs driving electric vehicles will certainly help us do that. Um, and um, the town's uh, comprehensive um, energy and sustainability plan, which was approved by the council, back in 2017, um, also points to the need to reduce vehicle miles um, wherever possible using um, a variety of diverse measures. Um, Maine Won't Wait, our 2020 climate action plan that um, is just about a year old now, points to the need for, um, or has a goal in it of having 41,000 light duty electric vehicles, so typical vehicles that we would drive on a daily basis um, on the roads by 2025, and that goal jumps to um, nearly 220,000 by 2030. So that is a huge leap considering um, we only have a few thousand on the road, EVs on the road right now. Um, and to meet the, the need for this number of EVs on the roads, we're going to need to greatly expand our EV charging infrastructure. So we currently have um, just over 200 level two chargers. I'm gonna get into what level two and level three are um, in just a few minutes. Um, so level two are slightly slower chargers. Level three are, are faster chargers. We only have 43 chargers, uh, level three chargers in the state right now. To meet the, the need or meet the goal um, by 2025 of having 41,000 EVs on our roads, we're going to need 682 level two chargers and 239 level three chargers. So this will be a, a huge jump from where we are today to where we need to be within the next um, three to seven years. Um, and then also the, the, mo the recent infrastructure bill that was passed by uh, the, um, and signed by President Biden um, is allocating seven and a half billion dollars for um, EV infrastructure with the goal of having 500,000 EV chargers um, available by 2030. Um, and just another metric there, we currently have about 50,000 EV chargers nationwide. So again, we're gonna, looking at a tenfold increase in EV infrastructure um, through the infrastructure bill. All right, so we've got all of these kind of governmental priorities, but the automakers are following suit also. So um, automakers are anticipating price parity with gas powered vehicles by 2025. And I'll note also that um, vehicle ownership costs of electric vehicles are much lower than gas powered vehicles um, because there's less regular maintenance that's needed for um, an electric vehicle. So once we hit price parity and the ownership costs being lower, EVs are gonna make a whole lot of sense for a lot of people. Um, the number of electric vehicles are, is, are, are expected to triple um, by 2025. So the number of, of the models that are available from car companies um, are expected to increase quite a bit over the next three years. Um, and then there are um, a number of uh, legacy car companies who are planning to go all electric, all electric. So we already have Tesla as the most well-known all electric um, car company. A lot of our um, traditional car companies are also pledging um, to phase out gas powered vehicles. Um, the dates in parentheses are their goals um, for the individual car companies to, um, to have phased out all of their gas powered cars and only sell um, electric vehicles. All right, so I wanna go through some of the definitions too that we have um, included in the materials. Um, so everyone should have received the, um, the meeting agenda. And along with that, there were some materials with it, kind of a policy memo that the, um, the sustainability committee has put together and um, a, a table that is modified from the parking standards in the town zoning ordinance. 
Um, for those in this room, if you don't have that, there are a couple copies up here if you need one. Um, and otherwise, um, we can re-email it after, um, after the meeting, or if you go check the meeting invite, they, um, hopefully you received, if you're here, hopefully you received it. Um, it should be included as an attachment there. So um, the, the work that the Sustainability Committee is doing looks at three different types of, um, or three different levels of electric vehicle charging. Um, as we work through kind of new development or redevelopment and what the requirements are. So I'm going to go through the definitions first. Um, first, we talk about um, parking spaces being EV capable um, or electric vehicle charging station capable. I'm going to say EV capable because fewer words. Um, so EV capable basically means um, just having the, um, the electrical conduit laid in the parking lot. So um, we're not, if we want to go back after the fact and install um, charging stations, we're not ripping up pavement in order to do so. We've kind of planned for it ahead of time. EV ready means that um, the conduit is installed and there's also electrical capacity available um, to install the, uh, the charging stations. And um, EV installed means there's a charger in place and it's available for use. And I mentioned earlier that um, there are a couple different types of chargers. So level two chargers are um, what's most common at this point. Um, it requires a 240 volt circuit, which is similar to what a clothes dryer would use. Um, it's a little bit of a slower charger. So uh, we can, it usually gives 18 to 28 miles of um, vehicle range per hour of charging. And um, DC fast chargers or level three chargers, um, are becoming more, sorry, um, are, are becoming um, more available. Um, they are, um, they can, are the fastest charging system on the market currently, and um, they can give us three to 20 miles of uh, vehicle range per minute of charging. So if um, in this area, if you're familiar with the chargers at Walmart, um, some of those are the our level three chargers or DC fast chargers. Jamie, do you know how many nationwide are level three out of the 50,000? I, I don't know off the top of my head how many are nationwide. Deb, do you know? Well, I don't know that. But I just wanted to make one more distinction. Yeah. That a lot of these publicly available chargers have been level three chargers, so like the ones at Canada or the ones at the highway. Um, there are some level two chargers that are publicly available like at the Scarborough Library, at the uh, Scarborough Municipal Building. The bulk of the chargers in residential spaces are level two chargers. So currently, a lot of these EVs are being charged at the owner's residence most of the time. And so that level two is an overnight charging, sort of a plug it in, leave it, get up in the morning, drive your car all day, plug it in, leave it kind of a situation. Part of what we're talking about here is the infrastructure for people who either don't have access to uh, home charging because they have street level parking or something like, I mean, just there are other complexities or folks that are driving further than the range of those cars. I'm sorry if I stomped on something you were about. You're fine. Later. It's actually a really nice segue into <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at um, kind of the different categories um, of of charging requirements. So um, as Deb mentioned, a lot of people, the most common um, way to charge currently is at home. Um, and so the, um, the, the ordinance update would include um, requirements for new um, residential or dwelling units. So um, at this point, the committee is recommending 100% um, of the uh, residential parking and single family and two family dwellings are um, EV ready. So basically a person buys a house, if they have an electric vehicle, it's pretty easy for them to purchase a charger and install it at their home rather than needing to figure out how to um, you know, run the wire and um, have space in their um, electric box for um, another 240 circuit. Let's see. And then we're looking at uh, multifamily dwellings. So um, all indoor or covered parking, um, the committee is recommending 100% EV ready for those spaces. And then outdoor or surface parking, um, there are different requirements. So looking at 20% 
EV installed, 30% EV ready, and 50% um, EV capable. So those are the individual parking spaces. And I should note too that um, with both level two and level three chargers, there's a way to network them or have smart chargers so that um, people actually have to pay to use those. So you're not just giving away the electricity. Um, there are services out there um, where they can um, kind of meter the, um, the, the charging stations so that um, you know, people are paying for um, accessing the electricity. There's also ways if you want to um, like set timers and have certain um, times of day, like in the evening, perhaps if it's in a, a, an apartment building, in the evening it's, it's free for, um, and just part of uh, people's, um, their lease or rent. Um, but during the day, folks who are parking there might have to pay. There's lots of different ways to set it up so that um, uh, the property owner or manager is able to recoup the cost. Yeah. Is that for new construction you recommend? That yeah, or? so this is just for new construction or redevelopment. So we're not talking about going back and retrofitting anything. That we have to do ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, and looking at senior housing, um, and I mentioned that this is, um, we based this off of the, um, the parking standards table in the town zoning ordinance. So um, there are existing parking standards. We have just, um, in the, the table that was sent out, have added columns to that to um, indicate what the EV requirements would be. So um, senior housing has a couple of different, um, has formulas for figuring out um, the parking spaces. There's one formula for the resident parking needs and one formula for um, the employee parking needs. We're looking at just the resident parking um, needs for, um, for this. Um, and again, looking at 10% um, EV charging stations installed, 20% of the spaces would be ready and 70% would be um, capable. Jamie, can I ask a question on those two? Yeah. <laughs> so for those, I mean, my, my math skills aren't great, but so that would be 100% at minimum EV capable for all those uses? Yeah. That's so what we're with the understanding that in the next 20 years, and we might be expecting these facilities to be in operation for at least that long, that we would be seeing a complete transition to EVs such that all of the residents may be in a position of expecting to charge those vehicles overnight at the place where they live, yep. but not anticipating that that is the case today. Um, and it may be that some of these numbers start to change as adoption increases, but we don't want to be in a position of needing to rip things apart in the next 10 years to be able to install conduit yeah. so that we can install these things. And I'll also note that um, electric vehicles among seniors, that's actually a growing segment. Um, they're really popular among seniors because of the low ownership cost um, and uh, because right now battery range can be a limitation for some people, but I, in the next three to five years, battery range is expected to increase significantly. But um, with the older models where your battery range was like 100 miles on a charge, that seems adequate for, for most seniors who are um, you know, not necessarily um, doing a lot of driving, taking a lot of road trips, things like that. If this is premature, please let me know. I just am wondering off the top of my head, like if, if there was a new project being built in Scarborough, say it was, construction was about to break ground next month, how much extra cost would these requirements add to a typical project? Is it is it is that started to be? We've, we've started yeah. looking at that, um, and we're actually hoping to get some feedback from the development community on that, um, because you are all the ones that are you know working with those numbers on a regular basis. I will say that install planning for this and installing during construction is typically three to five times less than going back and trying to sure. retrofit. So um, I'd like to add another comment just to put something out there for uh, the purpose of discussion. I, as I think about senior housing in my case, I wouldn't want to have a charging station at every parking space because it would really ruin the landscape too. And, and I'm not arguing against this. I'm just saying that's an issue. And I kind of liken it to we put in common areas for laundries and everybody works it out. And I think that's ultimately what is going to happen in senior housing. So to have to have 100%, I think we may want to think about that. I'd rather go in and have chargers that 
took less time and everybody shared and it was you know there for their use because again most of them are retired and they have the ability to do it not just overnight like you <clears throat> so that's a consideration that's a big expense for especially affordable well i think that's our question is what is the expense of laying conduit underneath a parking lot that would allow later installation uh, well, that's that ev capable number yeah. You know, if you're really serious about this, it wouldn't be just laying the cable. You'd want to set up your panels, your house panels, so that well, it would Well, that's, that's the 20% EV ready. Right. So that's the 70% is just conduit under the parking lot. Yeah. But if that's, if, even that's expensive. Well, that, that's what we want to understand, but yeah. that's what makes it possible for the community to change their mind later. So if it's, the convenience of having a, a charger at my parking spot that I don't have to move my car and hope somebody moved out of the way. Just speaking as a driver, these are some of the things that I come into contact with. Sure. If at my place of work, somebody else parked there before I got there and I can't park close enough and they don't leave the spot until the end of the workday. So these things get to be really complicated conversations. Yeah, I just went through this conversation in our condo in Florida. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That came up because we have a charging station. Most people have individual charging ability in their parking lot. And they have two <clears throat> cars. Um, but everybody is, you know, you cannot park in those spaces. Right. So it, it's a big issue. And I, but I think you can handle that, especially in multiplex. Well, and again, this is where we would love to hear from the developers. Can, 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 I, can I just interject though and let Jamie go through yeah, her presentation? Sorry, and yeah. then we can start getting into the, the, the dialogue here, just so. We get the framework all yeah. set up and then we can make those discussions uh, happen. Thanks. Yeah, and I just wanna say though, I'm really happy that these questions are being asked because these are all conversations that we've been having um, in the committee and it's so good to get the input from, um, from you all as we move forward. All right, and so now um, moving on to um, commercial um, uses, which typically would be public charging, um, looking at retail sales and service. So. Just to put out there that vehicle charging is a paradigm shift from what we're used to. We're used to, you know, our car is close to empty. We pull into um, a gas station and we fill up in, you know, five minutes and we're back on the road. So with electric vehicle charging, the paradigm is shifting to um, charging where, you know, or fueling up at a specific location to fueling up where we're already spending our time. So thinking about the amount of time that we're spending in certain um, commercial areas, um, so <clears throat> large retail sales and service, looking at um, uh, buildings that are greater than 2,500 square feet, we're looking to have um, EV chargers installed, about 10% of the um, spaces installed, 10% ready, and 30% capable. So again, we're not looking at 100% um, uh, of the spaces to be um, installed with EV chargers at any point in time. We're looking for a maximum of 50 um, in, in this area. Moving on to the small um, retail sales and service, we're thinking that people probably aren't spending quite so much time there. So we want to have the ability to install chargers in the future if it makes sense, um, but not looking to have any installed um, immediately um, upon construction. Thinking about health clubs in the same vein as large retail sales and service, people are spending some time there. Um, and so it makes sense to have um, EV chargers installed. So again, 10% installed, 10% of spaces EV ready, 30% capable. So the conduit running to those spaces. Um, and then thinking in terms of hotels and lodging establishments, um, this is again, similar to, um, to dwellings where people are parked overnight. Um, especially, um, you know, tourists who are coming into town, thinking about 10% um, of spaces having EV chargers installed, 10% ready, but having the capability to go to 100% at some point in the future if necessary. So laying the conduit um, for, um, to have all of the spaces we have EV chargers installed at some point in time. And then all other commercial uses will at least have to be thinking about um, EV charger installation. So 5% um, of the space is EV ready and 50% EV capable.
And then if, uh, if folks don't want to or don't feel like um, they need to install um, EV chargers in their development, um, there will be an option to pay an in lieu fee instead. Um, so looking at um, $15,000 per space for that requires a level three charger installed, $8,000 for a level two charger installed, $3,000 per space um, for EV ready parking spaces and $1,000 for EV capable parking spaces. Um, and the, the committee's plan would to um, set up a fund that these fees would go towards to um, pay for uh, charger installation in other public parking areas in Scarborough. And you'll notice there's quite a jump between level two and level three. Level three chargers are much more um, expensive than um, level two charging. Um, but they're the ones that, again, you plug in for 15 or 20 minutes, you've got a full charge and you're on, and you're on your way. And I'll also note that um, most of the time with level three chargers, there are companies that will come in, or I should say a lot of the time, there are companies that will come in, you can um, set up a relationship um, or a partnership with them, kind of lease the land to them, and they will own, maintain um, the, the level three charging infrastructure. Um, and you will, um, so you won't necessarily have any of the upfront costs. Um, and those ones are um, metered and whatnot. So people are paying for um, the use of, of those chargers. I mean, what is the, do you have costs at all, like in terms of these and loop fees? Are, are they paying for a quarter of the cost to have a charging station installed and ready or? So it, it varies based on like the relationship that you have, say with a level three, um, if you're, um, if you've got a relationship with an existing company, it, there may be um, no upfront cost incurred, or you could at least recoup that cost through um, metered fees and, and things like that. Um, so these are, these fees are kind of typical for EV charger installation. Um, and so I think that the um, the fifteen thousand and the eight thousand for the chargers, those are like pretty close to to the actual cost for in installation. Um, it can vary based on site conditions and whatnot. Um, and then the um, EV ready parking space and the the conduit, those are probably actually more per space than what it would cost for um, for a developer to to do it um, while they're in construction. Jamie, I'm assuming that the conduit is good for no matter what level of station that the, it's all about the station, not the conduit, right? If you lay the conduit, it's going to serve level one, two, or three, right? So um, that is something um, that I, if, if folks, like if uh, GP Cog or Cash will want to weigh in on this, if they know that answer, I'm pretty sure because level three has a different electrical requirements, it actually does need larger conduit. Um, for for those installations. All right, so I can stop sharing my screen at this point and we can jump into um, discussion. You'll notice we have a few more faces on the screen here. Um, so I had um, some we had the, um, the committee had some questions for folks are hoping to answer. I think we've already touched on some of them. Um, some of the things that we've talked about um, in our committee meetings and just wanting to have feedback from, um, from you all as we work through this process. Um, and again, that's why we're having this meeting so that we can um, get your input since we do know that this will be um, affecting you all as you move forward with your plans for development. So um, we kind of stopped our discussions on um, on residential charging. So if we want to, we can pick that back up. Where if people have other questions or thoughts um, that came to mind as we worked through um, the the presentation, we can take on those. Don't be shy. I have a question. Like it's more before we talk about talks. A question about like research by the group on some best practices where this is happening already. Like there's not a ton, but. My brother-in-law lives in Norway, the country, not mm -hmm. Norway, Maine, and that's <laughs> the leader of, I think, EV in the world. Like, what are they doing? How are they setting up parking lots? Are they doing clusters? Are they doing layouts so every space can get charged? 
are commercial developments providing charging or are they totally separate sites where it's like a business? And you go over here to charge and then individual retailers aren't putting them in or are they? So I visited some and I've seen some of that where they have big banks for like Tesla banks where that's the charging happens over here, but not all the parking lots have like chargers at every other space. It's like a concentrated area. Yep. Um, I've seen a lot of on-street parking have charging, which really the public or the city that's handling that, like a parking meter. That's more you know possible in an urban setting than maybe Scarborough, but there's areas that that could happen where it's not so much the business that's accommodating or paying for the cost of charging somebody. It's it's the public, but through cost recovery. So I'm just curious if the committee has gotten into some best practices, because I think a lot of well-intentioned stuff, but what people could be laying out conduit in a layout before we know, like, what's the way to actually do it? Um, seems like single-family homes seem pretty easy if it's going to be required, like you do it in the garage, or you do it on your site. Garages that maybe go with a condominium might be easier, because you can run power to them, and it's the homeowner who can pay for that and handle that. I think it's really kind of a surface parking that's pretty tricky. Mm -hmm. um, we're already doing it at the downs, and I, I think we're doing all three in different places. Um, but I feel like we're trying to be leaders on it, trying it out, but I don't know that we're necessarily doing it right or following the right model. Um, I'm sure we can get the cost of it. I don't have one on my head. That's mm -hmm. that I can get. Um, so I'll stop there. <laughs> so <laughs> those are some of my thoughts. I will say that the most common practice um, in this area is to have a bank of chargers. Um, that just makes sense because you're running electricity to one location as opposed to multiple locations. Um, but our EV users are very low at this point. So we have to be thinking, you know, 10, 20, 30 years out where um, more and more people are going to be driving electric vehicles. And so having a bank of 10 chargers is probably not going to accommodate all of the drivers um, that are, are going to need them. And I, I see Rocky with his hand up. So if Rocky, you wanna unmute and ask or chime in. Sure, I just wanted to, to jump in. I'm, I'm thinking about um, these charges in a multifamily uh, setting. I think about the multifamilies that we're building. And, you know, if, if when you think about adding those charges, you need to add the spaces for those charges. Um, you know, the town of Scarborough and most towns uh, in, in today's day and age want us to put the least amount of parking in that we possibly can. And it's all because of an impervious area. Um, but we know that our, our residents need every, every space we put in. Um, none of our projects have any excess parking. So if you want to uh, add these chargers uh, and you, you've come up with a formula and I don't, you know, I don't know whether I agree or I disagree, but you know, if I put you know, 10%, we need 10% more parking spaces and that's, that's impervious area. And it's not something that is um, popular in today's thinking due to stormwater. I just wanted to point that out. Jamie, it was my assumption that this is going to be based on what the ordinance says is the required parking now for that site. And the requirement for the chargers are, are germane with the number of parking spots that have to be built anyway. So we're not asking for additional parking spots. We're just adding, we're asking for the capability within the plan. No, I, I understand that, Rick, but but I have to assign every spot, every spot that I have. And so I can't give somebody a charging spot. That'd be their everyday spot. They might have a gasoline-powered vehicle. So if you know, we're, adding, we're adding charges, we're adding parking spots. It's the only way that we can, we'll be able to manage the parking situation. That's not the that's not the intent, and there may be some practices that may may change. But you know, you would assign a parking spot that maybe was just capable if they had a gasoline vehicle. What happens if they move out 
And now you have to assign that to a person that has a gas or a, an EV. Now they can't go into that parking spot. So it's not capable. What's going to happen? They're not going to move in. I'm not, I'm not following you on that. If, you know, if someone's got an electric vehicle, they got to be able to plug it in. Um, but we don't know who's got an electric vehicle and, and who doesn't. So we have to have a spot for everybody. And then if there are some that are electric, then they can, they can plug in. Um, I really, I, I think if we put some brain power to it, you're going to realize you're absolutely adding parking spots to the project to make it work. Okay. I would anticipate uh, assigning those spots. Uh, I mean, if you're assigning spots, there's nothing to prevent assigning. No, that's impractical because of the way it's set up, the way people live in their space and they want to see their car. There's just so much that goes into that. And, and I appreciate what Rocky's saying. I just think we need to think about it. Okay. We'll think about it. You know, it's right. not that we're opposed. There's yeah. a lot that goes into this and a lot in our market. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. My biggest concern is that the technology is changing so fast. And we're talking about conduit. But a couple of years ago, our, our, we had to plug our cell phones in. Now we have wireless chargers. And I'm wondering if that technology in five years, you know, when we're starting to get ramped up with putting conduit everywhere, it's just like useless buried in the ground because is it going to have solar posts, maybe, that will charge cars. I, I'm just saying the technology is changing so fast. And, and you're requiring a hard number saying, I mean, not requiring, but thinking about that. But yet, the technology, you know, plus there's six different types of plugins, maybe not, but I mean, there's no standard right now. So, we're talking about putting all this stuff in, yet Tesla can't charge it up at the other station. And again, I don't know enough about the charging stations. From what I've read about them, the cost to put them in far exceeds what the payback to developers would be. Um, at, you know, again, that check. You pay off that eighteen thousand dollar one, and that's outdated because that technology is no longer used. So I know it's a good idea to get on board with this stuff, but I think, like Dan mentioned earlier, we need to be cautious because there's not like a gas pump at every McDonald's You're right now. There's never, you know. So maybe there be a different model for the business. So all these, you know, I saw the goal was five hundred thousand charging stations. How many gas stations exist out there? How many gas pumps are there now? Um, I know it's not one-on-one -on -one replacement, but it just seems like we're trying to drive down because it feels good. Oh, yeah, let's have this technology, but the technology changed so fast. So it's trying to stay, just being aware of that, of that. And in that same line of thinking, the technology on batteries is going to be so much greater so, so quickly. This is not five years now. I think we'll see long-lasting batteries. It may be that people just have two or three batteries and charge them, you know, in their house or in their apartment or whatever. I think I think we need to go at, go, we need to solve this problem a little more slowly to try to do something all at once. That's my first thought. Um, I just actually had a question for, for Rocky, um, being the developer. Um, I mean, I think um, obviously, as Dan said, they're they're putting in some, I mean, I think it having this ability, having some charging stations may be, um, you know, something developers do as an advantage, you know, as an advantage or an incentive to get people uh, to move there. It's like an add, uh, added um, uh, benefit. But I'm wondering, would having this be an ordinance with these requirements at this point, would that be a deterrent for development in Scarborough, in, in his opinion? Well, we're going to follow the rules. Um, you know, if the rules say we have to do it, we have to do it. I, I just, I think we need to go through this process to figure out what's, you know, what the right rules are. I, I, well, know, I, I understand. It's not, I understand. It's not I understand a deterrent. That. I think as, you know, as time goes by, people are going to, going to start to demand these. Um, we're not seeing that demand right now, but, you know, we, we rec recognize that we will be seeing the demand. Um, so I think it's good that we're working on this. Um, the top of my head, I, I didn't see any of this information before the meeting and maybe I didn't figure out how to, I don't, I don't know where that information is, uh, but it, the, the numbers seem pretty high to me as far as the, 
the required number of, of uh, units. So I probably didn't answer your question, but. No, I just meant a little bit more as in, um, uh, if, it, if you're looking for your next project and you're, and you're you know, you, you're looking at a town that has these requirements versus a, a closer, you know, a nearby town that does it. Um, would that, you know, would that be a deterrent for you to do it? I, I don't, I don't see that as a deterrent. I mean, I, I see that the market, you know, um, the, 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 uh, the market is going to demand these. We're going to have to put them in, you know, whether the town requires it or not. Our, our residents are going to demand this, this feature. Uh, and I have no problem with that. I think just figuring out the right amount uh, is where this committee needs to go. Okay, yeah, thank you. I would agree with that. And I think my earlier point, like having some good models for how it's done in places that there's a lot of these. So at least we know what's working elsewhere and also learning more about different technologies like I know charge point is the type of charger where you get you some put their credit card in you can get reimbursed like having an apartment building pay for everybody's charging you know right now we're doing that and there's maybe one or two cars <laughs> out of 48 units, not a big deal. It kind of just gets absorbed. That, that's a totally different thing than um, paying for all 48 residents. And how that whole system works is, I don't know that yet. I know ChargePoint is one technology where they're doing it and cities are doing it. And it's, it's a curve, kind of like I was saying earlier, you just have a parking meter and you pay for your charge. Um, but, I don't think this group who's delivering multi-family housing has all those answers. So I think if it's just sort of quickly required, you could spend a lot of money doing the wrong thing and wish we had the chargers all spaced out like we said, or in a bank, or use this technology that's cost recovery system versus all of a sudden backfilling every resident because one person has a car, the other person doesn't like it's. We just need some more tools to figure out how to do this that aren't from rush. Jamie, I, I believe there's somebody from GP Cog on here, and maybe, maybe, and I don't mean to put them on the spot, uh, but maybe they could share with what they're seeing, um, you know, to go to uh, Dan's question. Sure. Jonathan, are you able to weigh in on um, how folks are dealing with, uh, like, the pay to charge setups and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Could you go more in depth on on what you're looking for there? Um, I think in terms of uh, like multifamily and, and things like that, how are developers or property owners recouping their their costs? What are some of the strategies that are being used? Um, yeah, so so there's kind of you know the two options. There's like the what you call like the dumb chargers, which are the non-network chargers, um, which can be an option that's usually good for residential um, because they have such a low price tag compared to network chargers. Um, so that's just like, there's no network connectivity. There's no internet. You don't charge for the electricity, but there's low cost. So it could produce um, some good incentive for residents uh, to, to sort of live there, come in. Um, it's very appealing. Um, or you could go the network option, which is a little more expensive, you know, maybe five to $10,000 for a level two charger. Um, but then you can charge the, the cost for electricity um, and recoup those. Um, but it, it seems to be the trend right now to be going for like the, the dumb chargers for residential because there is such a low price tag. Um, and that's just the easiest way to get EV chargers um, in the residential areas right now. Jonathan, could you, do you have some information you could share about, are there other municipalities that are looking at this issue? Are there um, initiatives that uh, is coming through GP COG that might, might uh, be helpful for this group to, to hear? Um, yeah, I can, I can turn it actually over to Cashel. I know um, he's working on some stuff with South Portland right now. Um, so he might have some good insight for you guys. We are doing a very similar ordinance here in South Portland. 
uh, we just had our our own planning forum with some developers and um, you know I'm sitting in on this conversation to get some further input and, and steal some of your guys ideas um, and I'd be happy to share materials there um, we did do some punch some numbers for how much you know these these would cost in some given projects um, but the distinction between networked and non-networked is really important because a non-network charger is akin to a washer or driver dryer. They cost like five hundred, six hundred dollars, and though they're dumb, you know that can be wrapped up in in monthly um, rents and things like that. Um, and those network chargers, yes, you can recoup the costs, but also you generally enter a service contract with ChargePoint um, or someone like that, and over time. Um, say the contract's 10 years, um, you can, um, you know, renew with a, with a newer technology. And um, so if th things change there, you can, um, you can move on from, you know, who knows how things will change, but you can, you can take those chargers out and put in new chargers. And I think, you know, the town of Scarborough would be um, okay with that. So hopefully that helps. I'm, I'm definitely um, happy to pass on some information um, from what we're doing on our end um, or um, provide some feedback elsewhere. Yeah, I certainly appreciate these questions because we have not looked into all of these things and needed to know what questions there were before we knew where to go next. I'm just Googling multifamily electric vehicle charging and there are dozens of guides here that can, can drive our work on that as well. Um, I have one more thing. Oh, in Silicon Valley, I know that it's become very common. I know some folks in tech industries out there that have started installing chargers. And what they are finding there is that they're needing to install the chargers almost as fast as they can because the demand for those chargers follows the chargers rather than the other way around. And so that's something that we may start seeing in some of these multifamily uh, situations as well is that once the charger's there, people buying vehicles to use the charger and suddenly there aren't enough chargers. So I've actually seen some of the documents at some of those companies talking about what the charger rules are and how long you can leave your car at the charger spot and what you have to do next and what the penalties are for moving them and stuff like that that we might start to see in some of these multifamily situations as well. I know we're talking about new development and stuff, but on existing developments at Fiber J, is there a process we'd have to go through to implement, you know, because say five years down the road, there's more EV cars and existing properties need them. Do we have to go through a whole planning board process, you know, to say we're going to cite those based on today's standards? Or so if your question is if you say the oaks I wanted to add, if you just want to go and charges, add them yeah. and you're keeping the parking lot the yeah. same as it is and you're really just running conduit, I think that's something we could review administratively. I think what I've heard in the conversations, um, that I've had with Jamie is some of the thoughts are, if your site is coming back before the planning board because you're making site plan amendments, you're adjusting your lot, that's when the planning board would say, okay, we have these new standards, let's take a look at, like we do with sites sort of meeting all standards once you come back. So um, depends on which approach it is, but if it's sort of the, just the developer wanting to add into the existing parking lot, that would be an administrative type thing. But I think that's what Raji is referring to is, is that if we're going to have all these requirements of these chargers, it's taking square footage away from potentially parking spaces. So now the parking space numbers are going to have to be adjusted, right? So just because of the, the absolute square footage of if you're going to add 200 you, you know, charging stations because there's a 200 dwelling multifamily unit, how I guess you, I'd, I'd be interested. Does that affect this overall parking square footage and that takes up 10 parking spaces? Now you have to add an additional 10 parking spaces, but then you've got, I don't know, because I don't know how, how big yeah. these, I, I can see yeah, sort of. I, I guess I'll, I just said, uh, I understood Rocky's question a little bit different. So maybe okay. Rocky, maybe you could clarify us. What I was understanding your, your earlier comment about needing more parking spaces was because you were feeling like if you're going with each, you know, unit one gets parking space one, unit two gets parking space two, that if you have a certain number of those that are um, 
EV ready, you actually might need to, rather than do a park unit one gets one, it may need parking space 1A and 1B, that each unit might need more parking spaces. So it's really more about the need for more parking due to the usage or the, the compatibility, less about the space for the unit, the actual charge unit itself. But I may have misheard it, so I'll-, I'll That's a secondary question. That's a secondary, then. Yeah, and I sure, think that yeah, I think it is a good one. And any yeah. notes of these questions? I'm recording. Oh, you're recording. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do have a second question or comment, which is um, what is out there like through Efficiency May and all of those kinds of organizations, whether it's a federal or you know, regional support to help businesses um, pay for some of this. And I, you know, Piper Shores, we're installing some chargers. Um, we are working with Revision Maine. Um, I think in the two years that we've been looking at this, or three years that I've, we've been looking at this, I applied for a grant at one point, we didn't get it from the Efficiency Maine. But I just wonder if there's a way for us to maybe share information with developers and businesses on some of these partnerships and, and efficiency um, reimbursements um, to help guide the businesses so that we're not just asking them, you know, do this and, and make it work, but actually providing some support. And then with the fund from the town, is there some opportunities for the town to look at ways to help support the businesses in some of this. This is a this is a big initiative, and and we recognize that it's a it's it's a national international initiative that is really important. <laughs> but I think putting the burden onto the businesses um, from a cost perspective is really high, um, and um, just thinking of ways that we can help support them. And I'll, I'll just share Cashel in the chat, which I don't think is visible on the screen, um, has put some resources in there that I'll share out after the meeting. Um, and we, st how states deal with the seven and a half billion dollars for EV infrastructure that was included in the infrastructure bill, how that's dealt with remains to be seen. I expect the state has their plan for um, kind of clean energy, for, not clean energy quarters, but EV charging quarters. Some of it will go to that. I bet others, some will go to Efficiency Maine um, to be um, provided as grants for people who do want to do installation. Efficiency Maine has a number of EV grant rounds that are available. Um, so there's um, there are local resources as well. And we'll have to wait and see how the infrastructure bill impacts all of this also. Rocky has his hand up. So if I could just touch on a couple of things, um, you know, the cost definitely is a, is a concern. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, I can't see everybody. I, I can see everybody sitting there, but I can't see faces. So I don't know who was, who was talking, but that, that was a good question. And, and certainly, you know, having this as a, as a requirement does nothing to help, you know, help builders and developers keep the cost down. Uh, but it's probably something we will, you know, we will have to do and, and we'll have to face. Ultimately, the consumer pays for it. Um, I want to, and I know I'm in the weeds, but I'm a logistics guy. I just want to point out to, to this committee that not all multifamily is created equal. And you have multifamily that might be a condominium, and you have multifamily that might be, you know, for, for lease. And those are treated differently. They're operated differently. They have very different platforms uh, for the way the consumer pays for things. And um, I, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but just if we think about some of the condominiums that we've just built at, at Scarborough Downs, we have uh, in a bunch of those condominiums, we have common garage bay. You know, we have common garages where there are 10 garage bays in a building. The power that, that goes to that building is paid for commonly. The individual owner of the condominium unit isn't paying that, it's not tied back to the unit. It's not going through their power meter. It's a common meter. So, and that shared cost is simply added to the cost of the monthly condominium fee. We start adding car chargers. Some people have a car that's electric, some don't. The way to do it is to share that cost out. There's no way to fairly, to fairly share that cost. We're gonna get a lot of pushback from buyers on that uh, as that starts to come to fruition. So I think 
you know, we have to think about the way, you know, like I said, all, all multifamily is not created equal. Our apartment projects, you know, we simply, the cost of the EV charger is in everybody's monthly monthly rent. Whether you use it or not, you're paying for it. Um, at this point, we've only got a few. They're not used very much, and it's not an issue. Uh, but I see that, you know, that's a nut that we're going to have to crack at some point and figure out what's the what's the right way to treat that. So, but my my main point of, of my comment was was that, you know, all multifamily is not created equal, and uh, it's not run uh, on the same platforms. So, something to think about. <coughs> Um, I guess I don't know who this question is made for GB Cog or even South Portland. So is um, Portland is ahead of South Portland as far as the EV charging ordinances go? Is that correct? And do they have some experience already in place, like how Portland is dealing with um, the what to couple things? The layout to Dan's point is: Are we doing this wrong? Like, are they doing some lessons learned that we can kind of uh, learn from and? and see what worked and didn't work. And to Rocky's point of different multifamilies, seeing how maybe it's a change in thinking about how you um, charge for your condo fees and certain aspects of that, I guess. I didn't know if there was any kind of, um, I guess, and, and I guess I was looking towards Portland if they've already got something in place. So Portland passed theirs in December, 2020. And I would definitely think it's worthwhile to engage with their planning department. Um, I, I'm not going to speak on their behalf, but yeah. I just to piggyback on that, I, I think a year is worth understanding, but the reason I brought up Norway, California, these places that, you know, a uh, town is a month ahead of us or <laughs> a year ahead. I'd love to see the five year ahead group. Like, okay, this is how it's working. This is what didn't work. Um, and I just know of a few destinations. I'm sure there's many others that this is new technology. Like, it's so, but I think three to five years is going to be more helpful than three to five months in terms of lessons learned, in terms of what's working, not working. Agree, but it's also nice to see, I guess, regionally, they're dealing with the same kind of issues that we would be dealing with, right? And and working through the same kind of avenues that we are through Efficiency Main or GP Cog or those other ones. So um, I think you need to look at, yeah, maybe all of the above, right? Like snow removal. <laughs> <laughs> Technology question. So I think next year, if I understand the commercials correctly, there's sort of a new crop of electric vehicles that really can go both ways in terms of the charging. So it can actually power your house if the electricity goes out. And I don't know whether or not those stations are significantly different um, or whether there's more information about how to pool 10 cars and and um, fuel a, a blackout at a, a multifamily site, but I, I don't know if those if that technology makes any difference to what we're doing. That is not something that we've explored. And that's a great question. That technology is just in its infancy, and my son actually just started working for a company that's doing that work. Let me see what I can find out from them about where that is in process. I think that is a great incentive for folks who are looking at, I think maybe first in the single family market, if you're looking at a $15,000 generator, as opposed to putting $15,000 into buying a new electric vehicle that can serve the purpose of a generator, that's going to jumpstart the, you know, I think the electric vehicle purchasing, um, particularly in an area like this. Where, where we're prone to losing electricity. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Well, I think that um, this feedback has been really valuable to the committee. I appreciate everyone taking the time to join us this, this morning as we um, kind of work through um, 
our, our um, ordinance development um, and, and get your feedback. Um, certainly have some things to think about um, and things to discuss among the, the committee members and um, planning staff and whatnot. Does anyone else have anything else or we can wrap up early? That never happens. <laughs> <laughs> You said there's more information you're sending out because it's links or something. That yeah, so um, Cash will put some some links in the, the chat that I'll send to everyone. Um, I'll also resend the, um, the materials that were sent out with the meeting invites for folks, um, if you didn't um, see those or if they didn't come through with the meeting invite. Um, and uh, if anybody has any, um, any, any other thoughts or questions, um, hopefully you have uh, my email. Um, you'll have it after I, I send out the information to everyone. Um, and so feel free to, to reach out, um, either email or call with uh, questions or thoughts or concerns. This is something that the committee will be working on for a while, I think. And let me just say too, to the developer folks, your industries may have resources that we're not finding as easily. And so if you have a few minutes to just whatever your industry resources are, just do that search for what you're seeing on commercial EV charging or employee EV charging or multifamily EV charging and send us those links. That could be really useful to us. I will just share one little tidbit that I found in as I was working through all of this, um, especially valuable for um, commercial developments who have um, Kind of the network or smart meters um, like the, the charge point systems like Dan mentioned there are other companies doing the same thing um, they give you a lot of really good demographic information so if you want to know who's coming to your facility um, to charge and then also to do business it's it's a really good information um, in terms of finding out who's coming to your site and it might help inform decisions for um, who you might want as future tenants in a, in a retail um, situation and whatnot. So there are some other um, benefits that um, that are not like obvious to as we sit and, and talk through these things, but other things to think about um, with the value of, of these systems and some value added things that might um, might bring to your, your businesses. I have one final question. Can you explain to me what the process would be? So this is a proposed ordinance. Yeah, so the it way gets, that it gets presented to the, I'm sorry, the zoning committee. It'll, it'll go through the ordinance committee first, which okay. is um, made up of three counselors. And so it'll usually go through at least two meetings with them, um, possibly more. This is a pretty, um, a pretty big change. So I can see that this will be um, quite a process with them and we may go before them a couple of times. Um, it'll then go to the town council for their um, first reading, the town council, since this is related to zoning, we'll refer it to planning board and planning board will review it. Um, it will then go back to the town council for a hearing and then a third meeting with the council for um, uh, the second reading and um, vote. So it's an extensive process. We are just dipping our toe into it. So there's, um, there's still lots of work for us to do. And let me just add the sustainability committee will now go back with these comments, try to gather additional information. We may be back to you guys with additional questions um, as we gather that information. And um, so, so we have work still to do before it even gets to the process that Jamie Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it might be helpful for the developers if you, if you could help the committee by um, you know, you, you run conduit for light poles and you run conduit, you know, down sidewalks for uh, lighting down the sidewalks. Could you provide the committee with, with you know, standard uh, cost uh, RMS values for, you know, what, what would be the cost of laying conduit? Um, and are there any special considerations that you would have to do with the levels? I, would that change the crushed rock requirement? Uh, you know, the different levels uh, so that maybe we could put some, you know, meat into what are the costs associated with this. That would be helpful for us. I, I also wonder um, to encourage um, developers to, if, if they were to go above and beyond our minimum required um, at the beginning of, of a development, um, 
in some of their percentages, you know, are there some breaks or are there some incentives that they would get from the town or something like that to say, look, we're, we're meeting these, but we're actually going to exceed these. I don't know. I think there's some creative ways to promote um, maybe trying to help move this forward um, for the developers as well. It would be a lovely problem to solve if they were going above and beyond <laughs> the requirements. Yeah, but if you make it it's nice. worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it goes back to, you know, we put sidewalks in so people can walk. And you know, this is something that we we really should consider with the growth going on in Scarborough. Um, you know, and, and the way the market's changing, this is something that, you know, it's it's definitely needed. And it is a little bit cutting edge. I think uh, we had a speaker from GP Cog address us last meeting and said Scarborough was one of the, the first municipalities that are really diving into the ordinance. Some of them are just going out and saying, well, we'd like to see 100% capable and, and just lay a conduit and then we'll figure it out later. Um, we're, we're really trying to help, help the design community, the builders, and the town benefit from this so that our residents have a place to uh, to go. Yeah. I'm just a little concerned that you're forcing this on developers in the sense of you, you pick EVs, for instance, but why not force developers to put in gyms in every place? Because we know that's good for people to work out. And so I'm just concerned, you know, you should let the market forces dictate it as opposed to ordinances dictating it um, at this time where it's not a developed technology. It's not, doesn't have enough history. So I know it's good to get ahead of the horse there and talk about these things, but I think by, you know, just those numbers that you showed in the beginning, I understand that placeholder numbers are not defined, but it's a little concerning that, you know, to require a certain type of technology, like, you know, you don't require a red cable TV in every apartment, but we do because the market requires it. And that's, that's just my concern about these EV stations. You might be putting all this technology in place that's never going to be used. You know, especially when you say, oh, a small business might need just one. It might not ever get used. I mean, a lot of times, you know, depending on the business, it might be a business that comes in, like a convenience store goes in, buys a store, comes out. Why would you force them to have one in their parking lot when, you know, no one's going to be out, ever using it, for instance? Well, so, just, to, yeah. And just to, to, yeah, I mean, that's what I don't really understand. And again, just don't know. I don't know enough about the industry or the direction things are headed. I mean, we don't right now require that every parking space in a multifamily apartment complex has a gas pump. And it's because there's gas stations. And, and yeah, I mean, if it's, if, if you have a, if you have a charger that takes 10 hours, the obvious time to do that is overnight. So yeah, you need it in your house, but is technology changing so that, you know, there's going to be a level four charger that can charge a car in 10 minutes, five years from now. And if that gets to be the case, will there be private charging stations on the road instead of gas stations? And then, you know, and then if you can charge your car in five minutes, you you need it at your you know you need it at your apartment. So I, I I just I mean I just these are just questions. They're just questions, you know. And they're very very good questions. And part of the reason, if you go back to those small retail, there's no expectation for installed chargers. But it may and this is where we've gone round and round ourselves. But it may be that employees coming from places that don't have access to charging need that. And so we were talking about requirements, at least to have that conduit there so that in the future we could go there. I'm also deeply concerned about installing chargers that don't get used because I think there's a negative message there that when people see a lot of chargers that are sitting empty, I think the message is nobody does this. When in reality, those of us are doing this are too lazy to plug our car in at Hannaford most of the time because we plug it in at home. I think we'll also start to see a convenience factor with drivers. I hate it when I have to fill up my gas car because I have to find, a, uh, I have to go there, I have to wait, I have, there's like a process. Whereas my electric car, I plug it in my house, I get up in the morning, I drive it, I never go anywhere, I never worry about the cost of things. And so for me, there's been a convenience factor with that. So we, I don't see people who have grown accustomed to electric vehicles transitioning to a five minute charge somewhere else because I don't even want the five minutes anymore. So I think there's a lot of things that aren't known. And so we too are, are wrestling with those questions, but also those questions about what then drives the adoption. So what does a normal consumer need? We're also hearing 
And when people say, I don't see chargers anywhere, I can't possibly have an electric car because I don't know where I would charge it. Not recognizing that they would probably charge it at their house. And so sometimes having those chargers that are available in the right numbers, but the psychology is not well understood yet. So it's tough and we get it. We don't want to tear things apart. I can't tell you how much extra money I've spent having my home torn apart and rebuilt over and over and over again to install solar, to install chargers, to like better insulate, to do some of these things that we're starting to ask folks to do out of the, out of the gates. Um, and I think we would be silly not. And that's, I think, where government plays a role, because you guys aren't hearing from the customers that they want this now, but we are hearing from the industry experts that will want this soon. And the things that you are doing will last long enough for soon, even if people aren't asking for it now. So I, I have had electric cars for six years, and I, I have, my perception of it is electric cars haven't grown because of range more than charging, but that's just my personal sort of perception. I've done no <laughs> research on that. Um, but my experience with my cars is always charge at home. I never need to charge anywhere else, in part because of range, because I can't drive to, I'm going away for the weekend, I can't drive to New York City anyway to charge like on a trip or et cetera. But to me, that says focus on residential as a first step um, versus sort of, I don't want to say arbitrarily, but just assuming that businesses have some responsibility to charge their customers for that one to 20 minute stop, whatever it might be. Like I, I, just, I feel like that's pretty shaky ground, um, personally, in terms of where we are right now. But I, and that to me would say, focus on residential, ready, capable, et cetera, but with like some best practice around how to do that incrementally and not jump the gun and install this great network and then throw out a site when it should have been just over here. Or you know, I don't know what the answers are, but that's what, to think about incrementally, that's what I would recommend. And the committee can tell you that I've been one of the major pushbacks on some of the commercial numbers because of that experience. And where my brain has started to shift is in recognizing the privilege of being somebody who has a garage to be able to install that charger. And when I start to think instead about people who are living in existing multifamily units that do not have this infrastructure in place, buildings that will be there for a very long time, when I remember that the convenience store has a lot of short time customers, but also has a few multi-hour employees, I'm starting to think about this in a different way and I've come around to wanting more of these expectations. I don't know that we've got them right yet and we're gonna to continue to talk about that. I think there's a lot of math to do to understand who these people are in this region. Um, and I don't know that we're gonna be able to do that math. So it may be that we need to jump out ahead in some of these conduit numbers, which again, you guys have to tell me, my sense is that that's gotta be relatively inexpensive in the scope of a project, but I don't know, and be more cautious on the installed charger okay, to let that play closer with demand, um, but to be able to play with demand as that changes. Yeah, and I think that's really the intent of this ordinance is to try to you know, take a look at those percentages that we have, have just thrown out there. Um, and, and it's really about, you know, the infancy of creating the infrastructure now and then eventually see, you know, what happens down the road, whether we need to put a pedestal there, um, you know, to service a, you know, the need. Uh, but really it is trying to do smart construction, build an infrastructure that we know. I mean, there's all kinds of data out there that says EVs are going to be growing, um, but isn't now the time that we should be doing the low cost measures uh, in anticipation of, of this industry that's not gonna go away. Um, and, and so rather than, than uh, look at just the fact that it's a charger, look at the infrastructure behind it and see if some of it starts to make sense or where it doesn't make sense 
what would make sense from a developer standpoint. That would be that would be most helpful because that's what we're really trying to do. We're not trying to flood the market with chargers. We're trying to build the infrastructure so as the market grows, we can do it quickly and cheaply and make it happen. And it's really hard to wrap your head around what's going to happen, you know, five or 10 years down the road when EVs aren't a, a popular thing right now, but car companies um, pledging to, to phase out gas powered um, gas powered vehicles, this is, it's coming. We, we don't know when, we don't know to what extent, but it's coming. And so it makes a whole lot of sense as we're planning now, um, rather than trying to uh, meet the demand later and have to rip up pavement to, to make that happen. So that's. I think there's a school district that now runs their first EV bus. Island. Now, as that goes and grows, the town of Scarborough is going to need to adapt its fleet and we're gonna to have to put chargers in at the town garage. That's gonna be on the backs of, of everybody, but you know, there's also, that's, that's why we're thinking of the in lieu fee in cases like, um, you know, it, it's not feasible or you don't wanna do it, you know, it's your property, uh, but at least the funding then could then be shifted to public use. And in this case, it could go to uh, school bus chargers. So it, it, the intent of the ordinance is really about infrastructure, not about making sure that we have enough chargers for uh, cars right now. But I think that circles back to why the Aloo fees are just, you know, pie in the sky guess at this point. It is, it is. I'll be quite honestly, it is. We don't know the, the, the cost. We have some costs about the chargers, right, but, but the not the infrastructure. Form you know, you're, you're, you're almost placing the demand on, on the developers saying, you're gonna need, you know, because you have this many spaces, we need this much money out of you if you're not gonna put them in. And it's like, those might not ever get used. And again, I know it's really early in the process, mm -hmm. but these are the things to consider, like, you know. Yeah, and you know, it's the same thing as the sidewalk and, and traffic mitigation issues on impacts of developments and stuff like that. Yeah. There's, there's things that, build it so that the community benefits from, from everything. Absolutely. And so as other thoughts occur to you, certainly send those through Danish and get them to the committee. Um, you may find that you notice things in the news differently. Uh, we would love to hear what you're seeing and what your reactions are to some of those things as well. So. Yeah, I appreciate your time coming out here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Going through this with us. Yeah, it's been really valuable to hear your insight and feedback. So we appreciate it. And on that, we can end eight minutes early. Okay. Okay. We are still early. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.